Good. All right. Can you hear me and see everything? Yes, yes. indeed. Yes. yes, all right, good, thank you. Um, hold on one second and then I will be set. All right, so thank you so much for having me. I'm pleased to be included as a presenter at NICP's annual conference. Um, I'm going to be discussing Cornell's uh, Cultural Property Protection Conference that took place in February of this year, and from which we've drawn articles for an upcoming special issue of preservation education and research. Um, as a quick overview, I'm going to be discussing the conference, how it was funded, its intended purpose, those that were involved in planning the event, as well as the principal themes that guided various segments. I'll also summarize the conference topics addressed and key presentations, including highlighting those papers selected for inclusion in preservation, education, and research. I'll close with some important insights uh, drawn from our presenters, attendees, and discussants, including um, the challenges facing practitioners, educators, as well as indigenous community leaders and keepers of traditional knowledge working to protect cultural heritage and ancestral places. Um, I wanted to start by situating cultural property protection in current events to make it a little bit more tangible and less of an abstract idea. Um, I'm going to bu be building on what Professor Tomlin has already presented regarding the historical and legal context of CPP. Um, cultural property or cultural heritage is meaningful, is a meaningful part of all communities. It involves not just tangible cultural heritage, such as religious buildings and sites, archaeological sites or important architecture, monuments, or artwork, or libraries and artifacts, but it also includes natural landscapes, um, what we call in the U.S. traditional cultural properties, as well as intangible cultural heritage, among other forms. It is intrinsically tied to identity, be it individual, community, or national and ethnic identity, and has been revered and protected, destroyed or vandalized, and interpreted or reinterpreted in various instances as a way of validating or negating individual and community membership or to support historical and cultural narratives. It is not then a stagnant, lifeless thing, but is dynamic, living, and incredibly important to the way that we see and understand ourselves and our place in the world. So um, the first image on the, on the left shows the destruction of a mosque in Syria in 2013. On the far right, you'll see the blue shield emblem marking cultural property as recommended in the 1954 Hague Convention that Professor Talman talked about. It's seen here in Lebanon um, in 2007. At the top of the slide is a quote from the preamble of the Hague Convention, stating that any damage to cultural property, irrespective of the people it belongs to, is a damage to the cultural heritage of all humanity, because even because every people contributes to the world's culture. The image in the center comes from The Economist. It's showing a monument in, in Ukraine protected by sandbags. Um, and I've also included two headlines here, one from The Economist discussing the destruction of a monastery in Iraq, and the other more recently from a U New York Times reporting on the destruction of cultural property in Ukraine. These are, of course, international examples and mostly examples of cultural property impacted by human conflict. But cultural property protection also addresses the impacts of natural disasters, particularly important considering the effects of climate change. So in this slide, I've included some examples of cultural property impacted by natural disasters. Um, those responsible for cultural property protection also consider the impacts of, for example, flooding and earthquakes or wildfires and so on. Um, in planning and preparedness, but also in response, so containing and mitigating loss, for example, and in recovery efforts. The image on the left shows damage to St. Catherine's Church in Croatia on December 28th, 2020, after a magnitude 5 earthquake. The image on the top right shows rubble from the January 12th, 2010 earthquake that struck Haiti and killed over 250,000 people. The quote is from a former Minister of Culture and Communications and manager of the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, in which he says, after trying to save people's lives, the next thing to save is people's reason for living. The image on the bottom right shows a man pumping out water from the flooded crypt of St. Mark's Basilica in Venice during the flooding in 2019. Um, and I've also included two headlines. Um, the one on the right is from National Geographic and it's discussing uh, how pollution is threatening some of the world's oldest rock carvings in Australia. 
This is from um, April of this year. And the other on the left is from the New York Times discussing climate change and human activities impact on Egypt's treasured antiquities from November of this year. Now, cultural property protection is presented so far it seems to be decidedly international, but um, effective cultural property protection involves planning and preparedness in advance of these kinds of catastrophic events, which is key at the domestic level. So international treaties and agreements such as the 1954 Hague Convention are meant to address the treatment of cultural property and conflicts, but include a range of responsibilities and activities that have to take place prior to any active conflict. And this is only fully achievable in partnership with heritage experts and cultural workers, such as those found in historic preservation related fields. In the case of the Hague Convention, the U.S. became a state party in 2009, but it had followed much of the guidance in advance of ratification as customary law. In any event, it means that the U.S. is responsible for a range of activities that impact military training, particularly in respect to educating their forces and establishing partnerships with cultural heritage professionals to do this well. Now, high contracting parties are responsible for what is described as the safeguarding of cultural property and fostering a respect for cultural property within their own borders, but also for cultural property outside of their territories or under the temporary control of a given state due to military occupation. So this usually means identifying and documenting relevant properties through compiling inventories or creating no strike lists as an example, and marking these properties with the blue shield emblem, although this is not always required, and planning for disaster preparedness. During occupation or conflict, it also means partnering with relevant cultural authorities in achieving these goals. So other peacetime actions include disseminating the text of the convention as widely as possible, including in military programs, civilian training, and especially amongst the armed forces and those personnel engaged in cultural property protection. The convention also requires that the parties foster a spirit of respect for the culture and cultural property of all peoples, and training programs are seen as important to addressing these provisions. So this means that there is a need to recruit cultural property specialists to make sure that the military's the military actions and objectives foster a respect for CP in line with the convention and their treaty obligations. But there is an additional responsibility, and that is to collaborate with civilian experts as well. So the image here showcased some of the training programs in CPP responsible for educating military personnel, including um, the Army Monuments Officer Training Program, as well as the extensive training efforts at Fort Drum. Um, Dr. Rush will touch more on her experiences in training in her presentation. Beyond this, the U.S. military is also responsible for adhering to domestic law regarding the management and consideration of cultural heritage, including all relevant environmental and cultural heritage law governing the actions of federal agencies and those receiving federal funding in our instance. So including, as an example, the National Historic Preservation Act and associated consultation responsibilities. So all of this to say that the initial intent of the conference was influenced by an appreciation for the impact of military actions and activities on natural and cultural resources, not only abroad, but also at home, um, particularly because the DOD is responsible for the stewardship of over 26 million acres of land worldwide, including 8.8 .8 million acres within the US. These lands fall under the purview of various military departments and defense agencies and encompass a wide range of important natural and cultural resources and heritage properties. Military land management managers and planners are thus responsible for adhering to environmental and preservation laws, as I said, and identifying and protecting these resources while also needing to account for the special conditions and activities required of military installations and sites and training areas including CPP responsibilities while deployed. So as stewards of vast tracts of land across the United States and abroad, military land managers can impact forever the environmental and cultural resources for which they're responsible. So poor management can result in the damage or loss of vital resources, including those significant to the understanding of local or even national history, as well as military history. And as I said before, both natural and historical resources can serve as important components of community identity. And in the case of archaeological resources, maybe the only line of evidence associated with the past lived experiences of underserved or underrepresented groups. 
So military lands are also often the site of important traditional cultural properties that are deeply meaningful to descendant communities and thus speak to an important ethical responsibility in behalf of these communities for the continued care and consideration of these resources and heritage places. So I've included an infographic I came across visualizing the percentage of a given state comprised of military sites. Um, and it also lists the top 10 largest military sites by acreage. The other graph shows the percentage of federal land acreage by service. Um, both are based on a base structure report produced by the DOD for the fiscal year 2018. So the initial hope in applying for funding was to pursue funding that would allow us to put together a conference that could connect academic and military experts um, to showcase some of the innovative methods and practices being developed to ensure the preservation of cultural and natural resources on U.S. military lands, um, to discuss and address legal obligations and policy interpretations, as well as to explore technological advancements and solutions, including pioneering approaches to military training, and the training of civilians in the military. The conference was supported by a preservation technology and training grant from the National Park Service's National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. The planning team was made up of those with extensive backgrounds in cultural heritage preservation, military training and education, cultural natural resource management, including in military contexts and on military lands. We made a point of including not only academics on the planning team, but also international experts, as well as applied practitioners in an attempt to ground the conference planning process and to make sure that the themes and speakers were selected so as to center discussions on the doing of cultural heritage management and cultural property protection. Um, an additional goal was to reorient the discussion of CPP to include early career professionals, um, to explore new and innovative approaches to natural and cultural resource management and CPP, and most importantly, to center the perspectives of indigenous voices as the first host nations. Now, even this term was problematized in our discourse of the conference itself, but essentially the conference was designed as an acknowledgement of the effects of military actions, including the impacts of the culture and value systems of military personnel, as well as the impacts and influence of education and training programs, leadership and decision-making processes on the interpretation of legal and ethical responsibilities and the doing of CPP both at home and abroad. Discussions addressed in various ways these complex contexts, but attendees and speakers also acknowledge that these complexities could be seen and in how indigenous leaders and educators and keepers of traditional knowledge were considered or not in the management of ancestral lands and important heritage places under military control. And as some of our indigenous attendees would be more apt to say, under military occupation. So the conference was organized across four major themes. These themes, um, framing each of the conference sessions. The first, a vision for cultural property, was meant to express the ideal. Presenters considered the key question, what should future implementation of a meaningful cultural property protection pro program look like? And we're given a prompt that not only acknowledged the great responsibility that military land managers had in respect to protecting ancestral places, including in accordance with domestic environmental and preservation laws, but also their moral obligation to do so. The prompt also oriented the discussion to educating personnel, the importance of CPP and mission success, and the need to examine the obligations and policies that guide decision-making, planning, and consultation processes. The next session, a new generation of soldiers and stewards addressed issues related to training and education, particularly showcasing the experiences of early career professionals, including their perspectives on current training programs. Presenters also included those from military education and field training programs, both in the US and abroad, as well as educators from civilian academic and cultural institutions and indigenous community leaders and keepers of traditional knowledge. Presenters in this session explored what they saw as persistent challenges in preparing service members for their responsibilities regarding cultural property protection in combat zones, but also in respect to the protection of cultural and natural resources important to indigenous communities impacted by military installations, sites, training areas, and associated activities. Session three, the value of partnerships collaboration with the military to save cultural property at home and abroad, considered the question, what is the nature of meaningful partnerships for saving cultural property and who should these partners be? 
As noted previously, the military has long tapped into the expertise of professionals and academics outside of the ranks, but the 1954 Hague Convention further enshrines this relationship by requiring peacetime actions, such as the implementation of military guidelines, regulations, and or directives, including pertinent training programs that educate armed service members at all levels of the military and across all branches and the parameters and responsibilities put forth by the convention. This includes recruitment of cultural property specialists, that work to ensure that military actions and objectives foster respect for CPP in line with the Convention and U.S. Treaty obligations and collaboration with civilian experts and authorities are also a part of that responsibility. Presentations in this section explored the important relationships between academics, professionals, indigenous communities in the military and working to protect cultural and natural resources, including both successful efforts and failures including papers exploring both cultural and value-based challenges to prioritizing CPP efforts and planning and decision-making processes, barriers to consultation experienced by TIPOs and other indigenous leaders, a discussion of the history of the CPP movement in the US, eventually leading to the ratification of the Hague Convention, as well as showcasing the use of technology and monitoring important cultural sites, both in cases of human conflict and natural disasters, and how this technology was being used to improve response efforts and also document intentional destruction by various military actors. The final session, Achieving the Vision of CPP, Honoring the Treaties and Following the Law, served as a bookend. It was it reflects on the aspirational hopes of session one's vision and, and works to answer the, the key question, how do we use past progress as a foundation for building a CPP program for the future? Presentations in this um, section include reflections on the safety of heritage professionals and partners, including the difficulty in securing visas for many cultural workers, the role of stability placing, policing in CPP, and considerations of the future of the field. Now, we were quite lucky in respect to our keynote speakers, and we were able to secure the involvement of not only experienced military leadership, but also that of prominent indigenous scholars and leaders. Speakers were able to draw on their considerable experience to elucidate um, best practices, including how to build partnerships and foster the kinds of relationships needed to create mutually respectful collaboration between indigenous communities and the military. Lieutenant General Peterson was able to provide key insights as to how the military is changing in the current world climate, how these shifts impact many aspects of training, including reflecting on what must be done to further improve and build a CPP program for the future. Now I have some, I've included some quick highlights from the event on this slide. Um, we, we were, a little bit, we were more successful than we expected to be. So we were able to secure 26 presenters across three days. And these represented um, early professionals, early career professionals, as well as experienced CPP educators and practitioners. The speakers were drawn from, th from the three major military service branches. So the Army, Air Force, and Navy, but also um, included representatives from the Defense Intelligence Agency and NATO and indigenous leaders and keepers of traditional knowledge, some with military service backgrounds. Um, we had a the presenters came with a full range of backgrounds and expertise. Um, some were museum directors and curators or legal professionals, academics and preservation specialists. We had military officers and indigenous leaders, including a clan mother, faith keeper, and keepers of traditional knowledge. Archaeologists were present, early career professionals in the military, um, TIPOs, as well as the director of the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative and the director of the 38G program or the Army Monuments Officers Program, or AMOT. So this is a small sampling of some of the presentations. Uh, they were really diverse, ranging from those that were very specifically oriented to military context and conflict, including those addressing the um, changing state of world affairs. And as Professor Tomlin said, it, it noted, it's important to keep in mind that Russia's invasion of Ukraine took place during the conference. Um, there were presentations that were very intentionally, internationally focused. Um, others that explored very specific understandings of international law and the law of armed conflict as it relates to CPP. Other presentations covered um, documentation of focused attacks on cultural property and how to use technology, specifically satellite imagery, to document these violations of LOAC um, for future tribunals. Still others considered how CP is often destroyed or manipulated as a form of information warfare or to undermine the existence of communities and peoples marginalized by regimes and as a consequence of regime change. Um, 
cultural genocide, essentially. Um, indigenous partners um, discuss challenges in building mutually respectful and beneficial partnerships and the importance of other ways of knowing and traditional knowledge systems. And many spent the time to educate and orient presenters and attendees to important cultural and historical contexts of the indigenous communities they represented. So now I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the papers that were selected for inclusion in the upcoming special issue of PER. Um, one of the papers that we selected was written by Dr. Anna Kaiser. She's an assistant professor for applied cultural property protection at the University for Continuing Education in Krems. Um, her research focuses on emergency preparedness of cultural property, both in uh, respect to natural disasters and armed conflict. She coordinates EU research projects dealing with the protection of cultural heritage and is the scientific director of a postgraduate master's degree program in cultural property protection at the University for Continuing Education at Crumbs. Her paper is entitled Joint Exercises in Heritage Protection as a Means to Establish Interfaces and in Cooperation with Emergency Responders. In this case, um, she really focused on the, the disconnect between uh, cultural heritage professionals and first responders and military personnel. And had compared several case studies um, around the ways in which you could situate and train um, cultural heritage professionals to sort of insert themselves into um, some of the um, essentially conditions of uh, emergency response and kind of discussing the ways in which um, you could develop uh, and and train cultural workers to to establish interfaces for cooperation in these very kind of like diverse fields. Um, and so she did discuss sort of the cultural differences and the expectation differences, the workflow differences that affect the ways in which collaboration um, can happen. So essentially the idea that uh, you were more successful in training heritage professionals to adapt to um, first responders than the other way around because first responders essentially have these very strict um, methods that they have to adhere to and policies that they have to adhere to. And the success that she had both in like tabletop um, kinds of uh, exercises as well as the ones that were field training. Um, and so it's incredibly interesting article and in sort of dealing with the ways in which we think, um, the ways in which collaboration can happen and the kinds of things that get in, in the way of really good collaboration between these um, very diverse sort of um, backgrounds that come to the table uh, in cultural property protection for natural disasters and human conflict. Now, the next article um, was written by uh, some of the staff of the Cultural Heritage Monitoring Lab, which I guess is essentially a partnership between the Virginia Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. The lab monitors cultural heritage sites that are likely or currently impacted by natural disasters and human conflicts through the use of various technologies, but um, also satellite imagery in real time. So it's housed at the Virginia Museum of Natural History, but it's supported by staff located at the museum and also uh, those that are working remotely and includes archeologists and art historians, GIS experts and other heritage practitioners. Um, This paper is entitled Partners as Stakeholders in Cultural Property Protection, Bridging the Intrinsic and Instrumental Value of Cultural Heritage. It explores the very pro various projects undertaken by the lab while examining the impacts of the distinctions between cultural heritage practitioners who perceive cultural property as having uh, intrinsic value and entities that engage in cultural property protection for its instrumental value, including um, ways to adjust reporting methods and best practices when working with entities with divergent priorities and resources, um, including providing principles for um, forging effective partnerships that bridge the gap between these communities. Um, it also does a really good job of um, showing the fantastic impacts of satellite imagery um, and working between those that are monitoring satellite in imagery and those that are kind of working in the field. Um, so it's a great technology um, and methods paper as well. Our next paper is by Dr. Dan Brian Daniels, who's the Director of Research and Programs at Penn Cultural Heritage Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he's the he's also the Vice President, U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield, and the Vice President for Cultural Heritage 
for the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, his paper is Protecting Heritage Professionals as Part of Cultural Property Protection, Lessons Learned from Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. His paper explores the dangers facing cultural workers who themselves become military targets um, by conflict actors. And the fact that this trend of targeting cultural workers seems to be increasing rather than decreasing. In this paper, he discusses some of his personal experiences of working with cultural workers, particularly framed by Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan including the difficulty in securing the safety of colleagues in conflict zones and proposing some ways in which the heritage community can help secure the safety of these partners. The next paper is entitled The Importance of Cultural Property Protection for the Army and the DOD. Um, and this was written by Lieutenant General Eric Peterson, Deputy Chief of Staff G8 for the Army. He is, um, He's held a variety of key command, staff, and leadership positions at the headquarters department of the Army, division, and brigade levels, including four tours with the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment Airborne. In 2014, he became the first recipient of the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield Award for Meritorious Military Service and the Protection of Cultural Property. In his paper, he discusses the changing strategic environment and the impact of these shifts on military planning and operations, but also the ways in which cultural property protection can help the Army achieve its objectives. He proposes a vision for the future of cultural property protection programs within the US DOD, including focusing on four aspects, professional military education, the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to build CPP databases to inform military decision-making, um, pre-deployment training, and fostering an appreciation of other cultures. Um, he essentially says that through its deliberate consideration, the deliberate consideration of CPP into military operations, CPP, he believes, can contribute to advancing U.S. national security interests, including aiding in conflict prevention and resolution. Um, the last paper is by Turner Hunt, um, the TIPO for the Muscogee Cree um, Nation and, formal, and former civil affairs specialist for the U.S. Army Reserve. His paper is entitled Building Rapport and the Foundation of Good Partnerships, um, the Muscogee Cree Nation Approach to Protecting Cultural Sites in Partnership with DOD Components. Um, in this paper, he essentially explores some of the um, challenges that he's faced in ensuring um, that cultural property is protected, um, particularly in light of the fact uh, that in the particularly in light of tribal nations that have been removed from their ancestral lands and relocated in the mid-19th century at the bequest of Andrew Jackson. So his article describes how the nation seeks to ensure cultural property protection by utilizing policy-driven consultation as rapport-building opportunities and developing good working relationships with the Department of Defense components. Okay, so there were some key issues, insights, and takeaways that were identified by the presenters and the attendees. Um, these included that there is a rift between academic heritage professionals in the military or civilian experts working with the military and a need to create stronger partnerships and reach back support, including fostering a network of civilian experts and cultural workers to help the military meet their ethical and legal responsibilities in respect to CPP. Um, individuals do matter and make a difference in how successful CPP efforts are in practice. Um, institutional values and perceived priorities have a great impact, but CPP efforts are also impacted by individuals in positions of power, including in how laws and policies are interpreted and applied, and whether or not CPP is prioritized. And this can greatly uh, impact how... Yeah, uh, can you give me like five minutes? I was just putting together stuff for meeting... Um... So I'm just piling boxes. Um, Ooh, can you give me just a few minutes? Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm hearing someone else. Okay. So we, uh, sure, yeah, and just call you on your, uh, I'll just call you, um, your, is your cell phone easiest? Okay, okay, I'll do that in like five or 10 minutes. All right, so sorry, I'm hearing somebody else coming in. Anyway, so where was, where was I here? Yes, so, um, essentially how laws and policies are interpreted and applied and whether or not CPP is prioritized, this can greatly impact how effective CPP efforts are in real world context. The other issue that came up was the compartmentalization of CPP efforts, such as in respect to training programs, best practices are exemplified in institutional knowledge, um, which is problematic across the military. It is greatly impacted by frequent 
personnel change. Um, and this disconnect can be seen between installations and training programs within and between various military branches, as training may be well-funded or innovative and responsive at one installation, often because of a buy-in from leadership and the influence of key civilian cultural heritage personnel. But this program isn't necessarily available everywhere, as these activities, best practices, and expertise are often siloed. The conference also brought attention to variability in the experiences of descendant communities when working with the military as partners. So collaboration, consultation experiences were not always meaningful or mutually respective, respectful as some military personnel charged with consultation and developing partnerships might not be well informed in how to identify and maintain contact with important partners and stakeholders. Um, and this was particularly um, visible in, in sort of uh, managing relationships or sort of establishing relationships with stakeholders that are not necessarily still located on their ancestral lands. Um, there was also sort of the statement that great partnerships take time and the ability to build relationships over the long term is key, but it is not always possible due to the aforementioned frequent personnel changes that are characteristic of the military. There was also a lot of discussion around the innate cultural divide between cultural heritage personnel, professionals and military professionals, including communication style and reporting expectations, priorities, and so on. Um, and as I said, this has been explained by some of our presenters as a result of a difference between those who intrinsically value CP and those who see CP for its instrumental value, and others who have described the challenges resulting from a disconnect between differing decision-making processes or staff work styles and procedure requirements. There's also a need to acknowledge differential access to the discussion, including recognizing that, as an example, Indigenous communities and leadership may face barriers to coming to the table, including things like when meetings are scheduled and where, the differential cost and time burden for attending meetings, events, and so on. Um, communities also face challenges to the legitimacy of different knowledge systems and validating concerns, or even basic misunderstandings of community organization and the differences between Indigenous nations and how they're structured or organized. Um, there's a lot of red tape and quite a bit of administrative and procedural hurdles that Indigenous communities face, even when working with academic institutions, such as in the repatriation process. And finally, we also identified a need amongst our Indigenous participants to aid tribal colleges and universities in providing the education and background needed to support the next generation of TIPOs and cultural workers. This requires re-envisioning and adapting current educational models and opportunities to take into consideration the challenges that indigenous peoples face in accessing, as an example, internship programs or historic preservation training and so on. Accessibility is a major issue, as is the need to partner with tribal leadership and keepers of traditional knowledge and educators to address cultural competency. So that's it. Thank you so much. That's it is an understatement. That's a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> but the skin of my teeth, I made the time. <laughs> right? It's like, whew, but we needed right. to slow down and, and go back over a lot of that. But it's 